Today I want to share with you a sermon titled, Becoming a True Servant of God. Becoming a True Servant of God. And I want to share with you from John chapter 13, verse 1 through 5. John chapter 13, verse 1 through 5. By the way, this week we have about 50% of our church members away on vacation or business trips, including my wife. How nice. John chapter 13, verse 1 through 15. Let's all read it together in one voice. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel he had around him. You know, back in America, in Houston, where I'm from, there's a man named John McIlvain. John McIlvain. John McIlvain is a furniture salesman. He sells furniture. I think he started about 15 years ago, and 15 years ago, he started from a little trailer. He sold cheap tables and chairs out of a trailer in an empty parking lot. Now he is one of the richest most successful man in the city of Houston. Jim McIlvain is one of the most popular, also most popular man in the city of Houston. In fact, if you live in Houston, and if you've never heard of Jim McIlvain, then there's something wrong with you. And in the city of Houston, probably it is safe to say there's not a single person in that city that dislikes him. Not everyone may like him, but there's not a single person that dislike him. And there's a reason for that. Jim McIlvain is a very successful businessman, but Jim McIlvain is also a very successful person. One of the reasons why people like him so much is because even though now, currently, he is a millionaire, if you go to his furniture store in the city of Houston, you can see him in the receptionist area still to this day welcoming his customers. And sometimes in the early morning or during the late evening, during closing time, you can find Jim McIlvain in the back of his warehouse, unloading furnitures right along with his uh, hourly working workers. Jim McIlvain is respected because of not what he has or what he has achieved, but how he lives his life. Jim McIlvain never assumed, just because I have lots of money, that he is entitled to certain privileges. Jim McIlvain is, so, is respected because he, has, he is a leader, but more than that, he is a servant leader. He serves his workers, he serves his family, and he serves his community. He is one of the biggest contributors and donators each and every year to the different causes in the city of Houston. In this way, Jim McIlvain was unique. But he's not the original. He's not original in that he was not the original servant leader. That credit belongs to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Bible tells us that in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, that for even Jesus came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus lived his life. He was a son of God. He was the king. He was the Messiah. He was the savior. He was the deliverer. But before all that, Jesus wanted his people, all of us to know that he was a servant for us. As Christians, it is so easy to admire a person like Jesus. As Christians, it is so, admire, it is so easy to admire those who live their lives like Jesus Christ. And I can probably say, I think every one of us want to live our lives that way. 
I know that I do. I want people to respect me. I want people to love me. I want people to like me. Not because I'm a pastor. Not because I'm wealthy. I'm not because I'm not. Not because I'm strong or athletic. I'm not those things either. But truly in my heart, I want to earn people's respect. Because people see me as a servant leader. A pastor who lives his life to serve others. A person whose whole desire is to serve and help other people. As Christians, I think all of us want to be people like that. As Christians, I think all of us want to be respected because of those traits and characteristics. But here's the obvious question that follows. We believe that all of us as Christians, we want to be like Jesus. We want to be a servant leader. We all believe that as Christians, we all want to be liked and respected for those reasons. But then why is that that when we look around, why is that when we look at the people in church in churches and Christians, that not a lot of people live their lives in such manner? Why is it so many tr- Christians try to emulate Jesus Christ but fail? Why is that? The answer to that question is this. The reason why we fail is because many of us do not fully understand the definition of service. Do you know what it means to serve, to be a servant? I think we have an idea. I think one of the first things that comes to our mind is, okay, serve means to help people. Serve means to, to do things for people. That is absolutely true. But serving, having a true servant's heart, it's much more than that. And unless we truly understand the definition and the meaning of what true service is, you know what, we are going to fail. Just like we fail in our exams, just like we fail in our driver's test, if we don't truly study and understand the real meaning, the real definition, we will eventually fail. So what is a definition of service? What is a definition of a true servant? In John chapter 13, verse 1 through 5, it gives us a really a good definition, illustration of what it means to be a servant. Example given to us in the life of Jesus Christ. And from this passage, the first thing that we can understand about service is that in order for us to truly be a servant, we must have a humble heart. There must exist a humility. John chapter 13, it describes of this beautiful occasion when Jesus chose to wash the feet of the disciples. Now Jesus is about to leave. He's about to be crucified and die. And then he will rise again. But then soon later he will depart and be in heaven with God. And before he left, Jesus wanted to teach these disciples about what it meant to be a servant. More specifically, what it meant to be a servant leader. Because Jesus has commissioned his disciples, once I'm gone, you will go. You will go to the ends of the earth. You have to be a leader. But not the leader that the society has defined it to be. A dictator. A person authoritative. Nothing like that. But you have to be a leader. A servant leader like me. So Jesus chose this occasion to show his disciples what it really means to be a servant leader. And what act did he choose? He chose to wash the feet of his disciples. If I were to ask you, which part of the body is the most dirty and disgusting and smelliest? I think all of us would agree it is our feet. I don't know, maybe some of you might be your armpit, who knows? Maybe your hair, if you haven't washed your hair. But I think most of us, we would, we would uh, agree that it is our feet. I know that my wife, when our children come out you know, from playing, when they come, run around, ride their bicycle, no matter what it is, as soon as they come in, there are two parts of their body that they have to wash. First, they have to wash their hands. Why? Because if they don't, then they're going to get sick when they start eating. You know, kids, they put their hands in their mouth. But second thing is, they have to wash their feet. Because it is disgusting. We're always standing on it, walking on it, and surrounded by this enclosed socks on top of it, by shoes. 
and it is hot, it's sweaty, there's no air that breathes through, it is dirty, it is disgusting. So my wife, she makes them wash their feet. And I do that too. My wife, she's been gone for nearly 36 hours. And I've already made my children wash their feet twice. I don't want them to walk on, stand on the sofa or on my bed or on the, on the top of the blanket with those disgusting feet. Well, if it's disgusting now, how much worse was it back then, 2,000 years ago? You know, at least now we have socks. At least now, you know, we have cars and we don't walk as much. But back then, they didn't have cars. Most people walked. And the roads were not paved. It was dusty and it was hot. It was probably much dirtier than it is today. And if you are fortunate enough to be, have your own house and servants, one of the most important duties of a house servant was that when a master returned from their home, it was servant's job, the first thing, to wash the master's feet. If they had guests over, same thing. The servant's job was to wash the master's feet. You see, washing someone's feet was an ultimate symbol of servanthood, was an ultimate symbol of being a servant. And yet Jesus, Bible says he is the son of God, he is a, uh, the teacher, rabbi. He had hundreds and thousands of followers at this time. His disciples adored him, revered him. They understood him to be the son of God. And yet Jesus in that moment decided, you know what, I am going to show you what a true leader does. True leader serves. And he washed their feet. You see, that was not really a simple act. Because in those times, in that culture, washing someone's feet was an act of weakness. They believed that doing certain things that uneducated people did, poor people did, was a sign of weakness. And no one in their right mind, in their, in their status, would commit, would do such things. And yet Jesus, being the Messiah, the rabbi, the teacher, decided, I am going to do this. You see, too often we have difficult times serving because we believe we are too good to do certain acts. And a lot of people, we want to be on praise teams. And a lot of people, we, we don't mind being teachers. And some of us, you know, we wouldn't even mind being a preacher. Take my position here. But very few people would volunteer to clean bathrooms, pick up trash, or do other things that are unseen. Let me just say, first of all, that I am very proud of All Nations Community Fellowship. Because all the things that I've mentioned, many of you do this willingly and joyfully. And that's why for me as a pastor, it is such a joy to be your leader, your friend, and your pastor. Because I'm surrounded by people who willingly do such things that many people outside of these walls will not even consider doing. To be humble means that we are willing to do things that we don't always want to do. That's what it means. Jesus did not wash his disciples' feet because he wanted to. Nobody wants to touch someone else's disgusting feet. Nobody. Is there, someone, is there people like that? We do it because we have to, not because we want to. In order for us to truly have a humble heart, we must understand that sometimes, many times, we must do things that we don't often want to do. That's what it means to have a humble heart. It is important that we practice the talents that God's given us. But at the same time, there must also be willingness to obey when there's a need. You know, when I first came to this church uh, about a year and a half ago, it had been almost 10 years since I preached to children. I like children, but I don't like to spend a lot of time with them because it takes a lot of energy. I came to this church and I came to Tejan not to do children's ministry, but to do adult ministry. And when I came to this church, there was no one except for me that was willing to do children's ministry. So when I came, I preached to children, I, I went into the front, I sang and I led, and I, let's go everybody, let's go. And you know, kids picking their nose, fighting with one another. I'm like, okay, everybody, Jesus loves me. 
and you do that for one hour, you're emotionally, physically drained. Nobody wants to do things that, you know, that drains them. But being a true servant is not about always doing what you want to do. Being a true servant means that you do things because there's a need. And for almost, almost uh, 16 months, I not only led adult ministry, but I also led children's ministry. And to be honest, I'm thankful for it. It wasn't easy, but I'm thankful for it. See, we cannot be a true servant unless we have the humble heart and willingness to sometimes do things that we may not always want to do. One of my closest friends, his name is Charles, and he lives in America. He's really a great man. There's not a single person, I may, again, if I may say so, that dislikes him. He has so many friends. You know, he's one of the few people that I can honestly say that if he and I die together on the same day, uh, I think more people might go to his funeral than mine. You know, because he's so liked. And, and the reason why he's so liked and he's respected is because he has a servant's heart. And this is really a funny story because um, I, remember, I remember it was during um, college years. Uh, we were at, attending a same church, and the worship leader left. Worship leader left because he wanted to go to seminary. And the pastor said, I need someone to take over. Because I don't want to lead praise and preach. And he didn't know how, actually. He couldn't play guitar and so forth. But he wanted someone else to lead worship. So he would ask the, uh, the pianist, you know, can you lead worship? But she's like, oh, no, I'll do everything. I'll do everything. But no, I, I, I hate standing in front of people. I don't want to lead worship. So he asked the guitarist, hey, would you mind being a worship leader, even if it's temporarily? Oh, no, 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 I can play the guitar, but speaking in front of people, oh, no, I hate, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. And this was during one of the leaders' meeting, And everybody said, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. And when Charles, when he heard that, and he noticed the pastor having this great need, and no one willing to step up and serve, Charles goes, pastor, if you don't mind, you know, I, I'll, I'll lead it until you find a replacement. Well, let me tell you a little bit, little something about Charles. Charles has zero musical talent in his bones. He's not a good singer by any means. I am a much better singer than he is, and some of you consider, to me, consider me to be a bad singer. Charles does not play any instrument. At least I play some guitar. I play little drums. He doesn't play any instrument. Charles has zero experience in standing in, you know, leading worship, let alone standing in front of the crowd. He's never done that. But Charles said, when no one else stood up and stepped up, Charles said, I volunteer. I'll do it if you'll have me. What turned out to be just a, you know, his desire to do it temporarily ended up lasting for nearly two years. And for two years, every Saturday, he would come to church and he would, you know, lead praise team practice. And it's not because, you know, he had all this musical knowledge. He, just, he was just basically calling people to make sure they show up and they show up on time and, and pick out the music. That was his job. And on Sunday, during worship time, while everyone else is performing, Charles stands up here and he leads worship like this. Jesus loves me. This, this is all he did. Charles didn't do that because he enjoyed standing in front of people, because he didn't. He was a very shy man. Charles didn't do that because he was gifted in music, because he wasn't. He certainly did that because he had this desire to be a worship leader. That was one of the last things he, wants, he wanted to do. Charles did that because he had a servant's heart. And to be a servant leader, it means to oftentimes do things that we may not always want to do, or like to do, or enjoy doing. And this is the principle that Jesus wanted to show when he got down on his knees and started washing the disciples' feet. If I, your teacher, can do these things, so you should also do to others. One of the things that we need to have a true servant's heart is a humble heart. 
And the second thing that we need in order for us to truly have a servant's heart is a right attitude. Have you guys ever, growing up, had your mother always telling you what to do, clean your room, pick up your books, you know, dust this, do that, do that? Well, I did, and it wasn't my mother. It was my brother. When I was young, my mother and my father, they both worked at a factory, yarn factory. They left for work at 8 o'clock, and they came home at 9 p.m. And what that meant was that it was my brother that was in charge. It was me, my sister, and my brother. And my brother was in charge. And oftentimes, either the night before or in the morning before they left for work, my mother would leave instructions to my brother. He would tell my brother, David, when we come back home today, make sure dishes are done. Make sure at least a pot of rice is cooked. Vacuum the floor, you know, or do this and that. She would live a, live a list of maybe four or five things to do. And my brother would always say, it will be done. And as soon as my mother and father left the door, left, got in their car and drove away, my brother would turn to me and my sister and said, okay, here's a list of five things that mom told us to do. Pick and choose what you guys want to do. It's not that he would choose one. He said, okay, either you two choose two and you choose two. And he would, be, he would always say, I am the manager. Oh, I hated that. I said, why, do you, why are you the manager? He says, I'm the manager because I'm the oldest. <laughs> he says, I'm going to tell mommy. If you tell mommy, I'm going to give you more work to do tomorrow. <laughs> he would always threaten me in that manner. And I remember one time, I, re- I remember this because, you know, we usually remember traumatic events. I remember one time I was watching television. I don't remember exactly what I was watching, but it was something really fun and entertaining. And I was watching in the middle of it. I remember this because in the middle of it, my brother turned off the TV and tells me, you need to vacuum the house. And I told my brother, I don't want to do it now. Let me do it after watching TV. And my brother said, no, you do as I say. You vacuum the house now. There was no arguing with my brother. He's seven years older than me, and he beats me up <laughs> whenever he felt like it. So I had to pretty much obey. And I remember, you know, when I was vacuuming, I was so mad. It was so unfair. Because, you know, he's telling me what to do. He's not doing anything. And then, you know, he's being un- unreasonable. Why couldn't I do this after the TV show? You know, there's a difference in, our, in the way we vacuum. Uh, versus when we're happy versus when we are not happy. When we're happy, we vacuum really nice and really slow. Make sure everything is picked up. But when you're not happy, you vacuum much quicker and you do it much rougher. I remember when I was vacuuming. In, America, in Korea, vacuum head is very small because there's no carpet. In America, vacuum cleaner, the head is really big and it's very powerful, at least back then. There's a big engine and the suction, and then there's a long, you know, pole and a handle. And I remember I was so mad, and I was just vacuuming, and, you know, we have sofas, couches, and tables. I was just, like, banging on the wall, banging on the sofa legs, banging on the uh, tea table legs. I was like, gung, boom, gung, boom, gung, boom. I was so mad. Like, 15 seconds into it, I was vacuuming, and all of a sudden, bam! My brother smacks me in the back of the head. If you're not going to do it right, I'm going to make you do it again ten times. Well, my attitude sure changed after that. I was still angry. I was still upset. But this time around, I did it right. In my brother's eye, if you didn't do it right, then you're not doing it at all. You see, in order for us to have a true servant's heart, we have to have a right attitude toward the work that we're doing for God. I shared this story with you a long time ago. One time a church member came to the pastor and said, Pastor, you know, I, you know, I bought some new uh, copier, new copy machine, new Xerox machine, and I want to donate the older one to the church if you can use it. And the pastor goes, why, thank you so much. Of course we can use this was This was like 20, 20, 25 years ago when copiers was very rare and very expensive. And he's like, oh, thank you so much. A few days later, a truck comes by. It was a huge truck. And out of that truck came the copier. You know, when we think of a copier, it's about this big. Well, about 20 years ago, latest one, it was maybe about this big. Well, the copier this man donated was about 
about halfway from here to there. It was long, it was big, it was huge. It was one of those antique, out of date, very old model copier. And the pastor looked at the man and goes, wow, this is, um, this is pretty old. He goes, yes, it is. It's pretty big. Yes, it is. And he says, uh, you know, he goes, yeah, that's why I'm donating it to the church. He's like, really? What about for your office? And he goes like, oh, no, no. This is too, too slow and too bad and too old for me. But it's good enough for the church. See, oftentimes when we serve God, and when we, we serve God by serving, by serving the church, we have this attitude, you know what, you know, I, I work 20, 12, 13, 14, 15 hours a day at work. We stay up till 12 o'clock at night, but at church work, it's good enough for the church. We cannot be a true servant of God unless we have a right attitude. We cannot say, you know what, this is good enough for the church. A right attitude means that everything that we do, we say to ourselves, we're doing it for God and we're going to do the best that we can. If you look at the story, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. But if you read the story, a scripture passage very carefully, you notice that Jesus, he disrobed himself. The robe that Jesus wore was probably a, a maybe somewhat expensive. It was somewhat, somewhat symbolic. A servant would not wear a, maybe a certain type of robe, but he disrobed himself. And after he disrobed himself, he said he wrapped a towel around his waist. You know why? Because that's what's required for someone to wash someone's feet. In those days, when a, when a master came and when a servant washed the master's feet, that's what they had to do. They had to put a towel around their waist. And when they get down on their knees, and then they wash their feet gently. And as soon as they wash them, they would lift up their feet and they would take the towel that's wrapped around their waist and they would dry the feet of their master. One of the things that we notice about what Jesus did was, you know, I say to myself, you know what? Jesus is a teacher. These guys are like his children. They've been following Jesus for three years. I mean, surely, okay, okay, guys, I'm going to teach you. I want to show you what it means to be a servant leader. So I'm going to wash your feet, okay? So, okay, right now, everybody sit over there. Take off your socks. Okay, put your feet in the water. Okay. Wash them. Okay, all right. Here's a towel. Dry it off yourself. Okay? Now, I want you to do what, I, you know, do what servants do, like what I did. Jesus could have done that. You know, I know that, you know, when I cook for, you know, my students or my, you know, or sometimes when we go, you know, go on mission trips and I cook for them, you know, I'm like, you know what, okay, let's just, you're hungry? All right, I'm lazy. It's my job. It's my turn to cook. But you know what? Okay, let's just, uh, you know, we'll just have peanut butter and jelly. Okay, here's the bread. Here, you do it. You know what a real servant would do? A real servant would do it with the right attitude. All right, let me cook. Let me get the dishes. I'm going to make it really pretty. I'm going to make it tasty. I'm going to do the best that I can. We cannot be a true servant unless we have a right attitude. In everything that we do, we have to have a right attitude as if we are doing it unto God. And let's ask ourselves, the work that we do for our company, the work that we do at our home for our family, the work that we do for ourselves making money, and let's compare that to the work that we do for God through the church. What are we doing with the same amount of energy, intensity, and ownership? You know, I don't, I don't like to say these things to you because it sounds like I'm boasting, but I just want you to know, that each and every week, I give my best to prepare a sermon, to deliver a great sermon. I don't know whether you like it or not. If you do, I want you to know, it's not because I'm a great speaker. A lot, to, a lot has to do with the fact that I spend a lot of time thinking about my sermon over and over and over again. While most pastors get Mondays off, I don't have Monday off. Tomorrow morning, I start the same thing again. I start reading, I start researching, and I start praying. And I spend the remaining week preparing sermon. And let me tell you something. You know, right now we have maybe about 40, 50, 60, and oftentimes when the summer vacation is over, we'll have 80, 90 adults here. 
But about a year ago, on any given Sunday, we had 20 sometimes, and 30 sometimes, 20 people. But I never said, you know what, it's only 20 people. I'm just going to just prepare something half-heartedly, just read something, you know, fill the time. I never did that. Because I knew that this was the responsibility that I had, and that this is a commitment that I made. And whether there's 100 people or one person, I knew that I had to do my best because I'm doing it for God. We cannot be a true servant unless we have this attitude. A true servant has a humble heart who's willing to do things that they may not always enjoy doing or want to do. A true servant has a right attitude. They don't say, this is good enough. You know what, I'm just going to do whenever I feel like it. A true servant has the right attitude. They do things as if they're doing it unto God. And the last key to a true servant's heart, if we want to be a true servant, we cannot discriminate. We cannot discriminate. When you look at verse 2 of the passage that we read, we see something very interesting. Before, before the writer talks about, before John talks about how Jesus washed the disciples' feet, in verse 2, Jesus, it is also mentioned and it talks about how the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. We all know, for, for those of us who grew up in church, Judas, one of the ten disciples, he betrayed Jesus. And the very interesting thing about this passage is that Jesus knew that Judas was about to betray him. And yet, if you notice... And if you read, not just from this version, but other gospel, other books in the Bible, you will notice that Jesus didn't go around and say, okay, I'm going to wash your feet. You, 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 uh-uh, no. Jake, uh-uh, I know what you're going to do. Uh -uh. You, you fell asleep, okay, I'm not going to wash your feet. You talk bad about me, get out, I'm not going to wash your feet. He never did that. Jesus, knowing that Judas was going to betray him, knowing all of those things, Jesus still got down on his knees and washed his feet along with all the rest of the disciples. You know, sometimes in our service, you know, we do things for people that we like. We do things for people as long as we like them and we feel good about them. It is true. It's very true. You know, I, I do things for my wife when I like her and when I, when I argue with her, I purposely don't do the things that she wants me to do, you know. Sometimes she wants me to pick up clothes and I feel rebellious and I take off my socks and leave it next to the bed. I am such a bad husband. <laughs> and oftentimes we have that heart too. You know what? I don't like Pastor Paul this week. He didn't preach a good message last week. I don't like Pastor Paul because he didn't say my food tasted good. I, nobody said that. I'm just making things up. And because of that, next week, I'm not going to uh, show up early for church. Because of that, next week, uh, you know, I'm not going to write prayer requests. No, that's human nature. It is easy for us to serve people that we like. It is easy for us to serve people that we respect. But let me, be very, let me also be very, uh, very clear. But that's not anything unusual. Everybody can do those things. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to be a leader. Anyone can serve those people that they like. But what makes a true servant is having the ability to serve without discrimination. You serve and you do what you do you fulfill your commitment. No matter how you feel, no matter what your emotional state, you do not discriminate. I will give this person a ride, but that person, well, I don't like that person too much. I'm going to help this person with English, but you know what, that person, I don't like them so much. We all do that at times. But let me just say, we can never be a true servant leader if we discriminate. A true servant leader does not discriminate, but serves everyone. 
One of the more difficult things about serving is that we can often get hurt, especially as a Christian. We get hurt because people take us for granted. They don't appreciate all the things that we do. They don't talk about what we do anymore. We get hurt because people don't show appreciation. When was the last time people said thank you for all the rides that we gave, all the time that we sacrificed, all the money that we spent? We get hurt because some people just don't deserve our service. They act mean. They don't serve us back. We get hurt simply because people sometimes are just simply rude. But a person with true servant's heart does not discriminate no matter what. Because a true servant leader serves because they realize that serving in itself is good. A true servant serves not out of preference, but out of obedience. A true servant serves because of their relationship with God, not because of what they can get from people. A true servant leader serves out of love for God, not for recognition. But let me just say one more thing. And let me make this very clear. The Bible makes it very clear that ultimately, it is those that give and serve that get blessed. Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it says, It is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, when we give and when we serve, the greatest blessing is that we become more like Jesus Christ. You see, serving and giving is not easy. But when we serve, guess what? We become more patient. When we serve, we become more compassionate. Those that serve are more understanding. Those that who continually serve usually become more loving. And when we constantly serve, we become more humble. You see, when we serve, our hearts become more and more like Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus, when he saw his disciples, he commanded them, I want you to be a servant leader. Not only to serve me, not only to serve others, but by serving me and serving others, ultimately the person that will, bless, that will be blessed the most, it will be you. And as your pastor, it is my honest, genuine heart's desire that every one of you in this room become a true servant like Jesus Christ. Because in the end, you will be blessed because you did that. Let us pray.